Welcome to episode 27 of The Bio. Ironically enough, our guest wore number 27 during his illustrious CFL career with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, the one and only Glenn Suter. Glenn, welcome. Moj, it's great to talk to you again. I'm glad you're doing well. Yeah, the, the number 27 is is quite prominent in the Suter family, that's for sure. So it was. I'm, I'm happy to be on the show with you, number 27. Well, 27, you're probably the same vintage as me with Mahovlich fans out there, Harold Snaps. I don't know. Where'd the 27 come from? Well, I just, when I when I went into Saskatchewan as a rookie, they gave me four in the preseason. But of course, in the preseason, you haven't made the team yet. So you have to make the team and then they decide who gets what number. And, you know, my my girlfriend turns out to be my wife, was born on July 27th. I looked at the number and thought, this looks like the right shape because it can make a slightly round guy look a little bit more, you know, like in mm -hmm. a V shape. Yeah. <laughs> so there was a little bit of that in it. But, man, when I when I knew I made the team and I had 27, then all of a sudden, you know, my, my kid's first apartment in Nashville was apartment 27. My daughter's first place in New York was number 27. Just completely coincidentally, by the way, but... Yeah, it's been prominent number in the Suter household for a long time. And uh, in fact, all my hockey buddies call me 2-7. They don't even call me Glenn or, or Suits or anything like that. It's 2-7 all the well, there time. There you go. And again, fitting, this is episode 27. So it all works out. Hey, let's talk about Glenn Suter growing up. North Vancouver, you're born in New Westminster, of course. Great town, great city. We'll claim you, much to the dismay of Donnie Taylor, who hates it when I claim people. <laughs> but, you know, you're born in New West, so that's all I'll say. Um, what was it like growing up in North Van? Well, it was great. I mean, when I was real young, I mean, up, we're up to grade seven, I, we had moved back to Prince George. My dad was in the uh, telephone company here in British Columbia at the time. So he had to do those uh, satellite, uh, you know, those, those different um, sites, satellite sites. Uh, up in the north, and we were we would come down and go to one BC Lions game per year. I I love listening to the games on the radio, and I, you know I obviously love football. I started amateur football up in Prince George, playing sort of community ball, and then uh, we'd come down for one game, and I would sit in the Nally chip seats at Old Empire Stadium. And when you sat there, you could use a free bag of chips. Like if you emptied a bag of chips, that was your ticket in. All the kids sat in a sort of an end zone section and the dads and, and families bought tickets, you know, in the, in the real seats. And then after the game, the kids were allowed to run out onto the field. And when you ran on the field, you could high five some of the players. So I still have to this day, Jim Young's chin strap, dirty 30 from when I was a kid, when we'd come down from Prince George. And then, and then to get to North Van, that was around the seventh grade, as you asked. And, um, you know, we moved down to North Van, he got transferred here, and it was fantastic. I mean, to be part of the Carson Graham sort of legacy in Carson Graham High School in North Vancouver has always been a real sort of um, piece of sort of pride for me on my resume that I, I was coached by the great Earl Henderson, uh, who coached not only kids, but their fathers and then their father's fathers. And, um, you know, it was, uh, it was great to grow up here, fantastic sort of family situation and, and the start in amateur football with, with some great GSL football played in, in North Vancouver. And then, and then of course, Sutherland, uh, junior secondary, and then, and then high school at, at Carson Graham. I'm going to get back to Carson Graham in a second, but growing up, was it always football? Uh, were there any other sports that attracted you or, or was football always your first and only love? No, I, I loved hockey. I mean, I played them all when I was in, in high school. I played them all in, in elementary school. You know how you, you know, in gym class and, and all that, you're playing basketball and volleyball and all those different sports. So I, I, I always participated in all of them. I loved them all. Baseball a little bit. Uh, baseball was a little slower and soccer was a little too much running, if I remember correctly. When I was a kid, we were just running constantly. but. Uh, football certainly stood out. I, I loved hockey. Our family really wasn't, um, you know, didn't have didn't have the the uh, the the money basically to to play hockey because hockey you had to buy all your gear. And my my dad, you just used to say, "Listen, you can play soccer, you can play football. All we have to do to play football is buy your shoes." 
and the football equipment was was then supplied. So that's part of the reason that I was steered there. But I, it always stood out for me. I mean, I I loved football. I watched Canadian Football League for years, and um, you know, and the NFL. I watched both leagues and and enjoy both leagues. And um, growing up as a kid, loved it. I, you know, you put on the jersey of whether it be you know Nelson Martin when I was when I was getting a little bit older, or uh, was a safety for the BC Lions, or Ronnie Lott was safety for the San Francisco 49ers, Both of which I've had the opportunity to meet and talk to, and uh, sort of childhood heroes growing up for me. You know, you mentioned Carson Graham. I don't think people realize just how much of a football factory that is in some of the players. Like, off the top of my head, I will say Paris Jackson, Sean Millington, yourself, Jerome Pathon, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. who played some years in the National Football League with the Colts. Who am I missing? Gerald Roper, maybe? Yeah, Gerald Roper. There was uh, Joe Kuklo played for a while in the, in the, um, in the CFL. Uh, Braden Lenius. Braden Lennius yep. is, is a new player down with the Atlanta Falcons now, uh, who also spent a year in the Carson Graham program. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, when I got to that level, so you're, you're a kid growing up, throwing the ball around, keeping your toes inbound at the curb, right? You're, you're throwing around playing catch with your buddies. Uh, you're putting on your favorite jersey and then pretending you're that guy, including Jim Young. I mean, I had a Jim Young BC Lion jer jersey and I'd throw it around on the street and keep my feet in bounds, just like he did in the comeback kid days. Um, but when I got to junior high and then to high school, I, I really started to get this, this thought in my mind. And I did it, honestly, before Russell Wilson said it after a Super Bowl that I thought, you know, why not me? Why, why? It wasn't really a question. It was more of a of a statement in my head that I got a real young age. What? Why not me? Why? If I really work at this, why can't I get a chance to play professionally in my own country, or maybe for lots more money in another country? Um, but I just started started taking the steps, putting one piece in front of the other. Carson Graham was one of those pieces because of their reputation that you just mentioned. They had such a great reputation. Earl Henderson at the time was such a fantastic coach. He was the type of guy when you walked in the room and he had 50 guys there and he'd say, if you're here for the jacket, if you're here for the Carson Graham Eagle leather jacket, there's the door. I'll play with nine guys if I have to. But you have to be here for the right reason. That was Earl Henderson. And I got that lesson early. But Carson was one of the steps for me to think, why can't it be me? Why, why can't, if I really work at it, why can't I get a chance to play maybe university ball and then beyond that, maybe pro football? Sidebar story with Carson Graham. Brett Hall went to Carson Graham, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know if he was the same age as you, but apparently he hit some home run that is still traveling over the roof <laughs> of the gym or something. But I think Brett Hall also went to Carson Graham. And I'd have to double check on that. I know it was one of the North Van schools, but I'm pretty yeah. sure it's Carson Graham. Now, um, you don't have the grades to get into UBC, so clearly you're disappointed about that. <laughs> you wind up settling for SFU. Um, all kidding aside, but what was that recruiting process like? When did you realize that you had a chance to play university football? Yeah, again, again, it was it was a step through research and the reputation of Simon Fraser at the time was that they were producing a lot of guys that were going to CFL camps, going to pro camps, and. I thought, you know, that may give me my best opportunity. At the time, we were in the NAIA division playing against American schools. So we play against Idaho and uh, Montana State down to Cal Poly and, and San Luis Obispo and uh, some California schools. So, you know, we're facing real good competition. That meant we didn't win a lot of games as well, but we, uh, we were competing and, and in a lot of them. And it was a step to get again, an opportunity possibly at the pro level. And the difference between UBC and SFU was really quite simple. Like I, I like both, I really did. I, and I got recruited by both. I got recruited by a couple of schools down South. Uh, Cal Poly was one of them. And I looked at it and thought in, at UBC, the coaches were, you know, real sort of set on playing me or trying me out at quarterback. 
and I played quarterback at Carson. So I, I understood, but I went into those meetings and after testing, talking to the coaches saying, guys, I really want to play DB. And again, that was another mental decision step in I'm not probably going to get an opportunity, even if I'm really good. And I was okay as a quarterback in high school, but wasn't really good. And if I'm, you know, playing college, backing up a quarterback for two years and then maybe getting a chance to play, the chances of me being a, a Canadian quarterback in the CFL are slim, which is why I'm real excited about Nathan Rourke and his opportunity with the Lions this year. But, you know, I, I just want to – I just – I wanted to get a chance at DB. SFU said, no problem. You can, you will try you out a corner. And I thought that plus their reputation for putting guys in CFL camps, that was really what swung it for me. You know, Suits, it's interesting just hearing the way you talk about everything. It seems like you're always kind of one step ahead in terms of your planning, right? I mean, you go to SFU because you're thinking pro. Now you're at SFU and you wind up going pro and the Saskatchewan Rough Riders as a rookie, what, 84, if I'm not mistaken? Right. Um, I'm thinking to myself, what a landing spot. I mean, probably the most storied franchise in terms of, you know, uh, accountability. I, I don't know, accountability. Um, well, important for sure, yeah. Fandom, importance yeah. to the community, you name it. I think Saskatchewan is right at the top. And what was that experience like joining, joining the Rough Riders as a rook? Yeah, I was I was real excited about that opportunity. So after you know four years at SFU and I played corner all four years, um, got to meet guys like Jay Triano who tried out. He was a great basketball player, as you know, but tried out for the football team. And we were actually roommates for a year at SFU. So I learned a lot about sort of just approaching every practice and every day with great maturity from Jay Triano. And um, you know, coming out of college, I, I got a call just before the draft, because I was looking into, I don't know if you remember the name, Moj, Pokey Allen. Pokey yes. Allen, a coach at SFU at one point, and he had do, done some recruiting on me, and he was in the USFL at the time, down in LA. And I got contacted from them to possibly go and try out there, because Pokey Allen knew me, or knew of me from SFU. So he you know, he gets fired, I want to say, a month before I was about to possibly go down and try out in the USFL. And, um, and that just canceled that plan. But I'm looking before the Canadian college draft, because that really was, as you mentioned, the steps that I was taking, the Carson Graham step, the SFU step, they were all in an attempt to get to a point, if I was good enough, and if I worked my butt off, to get to a point where maybe I could get in a training camp. And I got a call from Frankie Morris a couple of days before the draft. He was with the Edmonton at the time Eskimos. And he said, we're probably going to draft you in the first round. How would you feel about being an Edmonton Eskimo? And I said, I'll, listen, I, I will clean the locker room after if I can make that team. And if that's part of the role of, of you know, playing, playing football professionally in my own country, I'll do whatever it takes to do that. So I was, I was, kind of feeling on draft day that I was going to go to Edmonton. I, I really felt like, well, they, I got a call from their, their scout guy and I'm, I'm going to Edmonton. And I didn't get called in the first round. In the first pick of the second round, uh, that's when Saskatchewan took me. And I was listening to the draft on the radio. And then I got a call from Saskatchewan. So immediately my mind went to Ronnie Lancaster, George Reed. And then the more I read about it and the more I looked into just what you mentioned off the top about the fandom and how how important that team is to that province. And it's every corner of the province, as you know. Um, when I started to feel that, it was like, this is exciting. This, And then I got off the plane in Regina because camp was in Saskatoon. But I, you, got, you had to fly into Regina, then you got meetings, and then we bust up together. And uh, I, got, I got off the plane, and I walked over to the old, old Taylor Field. And I stood there and I thought to myself, if, if I could just play one play, just, just give me one play. I'm going to work my butt off for one play in this stadium. It, it would be a, just a dream come true for me. Something I've been, as you mentioned, trying to plan for and work towards for most of my childhood life and growing up. So 
I was I was looking at that stadium in in awe, almost emotional, standing in front of Taylor Field, thinking Ronnie Lancaster played here. I just want to play one play. More with Glenn Suter after these messages. Forget about playing one play, Suits. I mean, you carve out a career, but what do you remember of your very first game at Taylor Field? Well, I, you know, I remember I couldn't feel my feet, and I was, <laughs> I was walking on the field thinking, "Oh my goodness, your your head spins." I, you know, one of the one of my my DB coach at the time was Jay Kane, and he was a sort of a sports psychologist at university level, but coached football his whole life, of course. Great coach. But he, he loved to play mind games. So in that secondary, my rookie year was Terry Irvin and, and a former BC Lion, Ken Hinton. And those guys were both eight, 10 year vets at the time. I mean, they were, they were great veteran all-star players playing corner. And both those guys kind of took me as a rookie under, under their wing. And so in training camp, I got great sort of tutelage from these guys, teaching me how to be a pro, teaching me how to study. Um, you know, just and preparing myself for the opportunity. You know, Jake Kane knew I was, the psychologist in him knew that I was so nervous. You know, I could barely breathe before game one. And we're in warm up, and he, on a drill where, the, where you run towards the coach and he just throws you, you know, just throws you a couple just to get your hands warm. He drills me about two feet away from him. He lets me run all the way to him and he and he puts one right off my chest and it bounces straight up into the air. And, you know, and there's crowd, there's crowd watching at that time and especially in Saskatchewan. And so there, I, I was hearing the laughs up in the, in the stands and I turn around and I walk back to the line and Terry Irvin is standing in the line. And I say to Terry, T.I., we used to call him. And I say, T.I., he does that again. I'm going to keep running and run right over because it was really bugging me. I turn around, get back in line right at the front because he told me to run down. He waits till I'm right in front of him again and drills it right off the top of my helmet. Bounces straight in the air. Crowd's kind of laughing. And I go back in line. I said, that's it. I've had it. T.I. kind of grabs me and he goes, this is not what you're here for. You're here. We're going to play a game. And then I went back. I asked the coach afterwards, why? And he goes, were you thinking about me? After that, or were you thinking about that you were going to just run around and, and make a mess of yourself in your first game? Because it took my focus away from why I was nervous that I was playing pro football, I was playing in Saskatchewan at home, and he just said, I distracted you, and that was my plan. I distracted you away from being nervous. Now you were mad at me. You played angry, and you played great, and we're going to start you in game two. <laughs> <laughs> I went, man, this is the same coach. Like he used to call me Pop Moj in, in training camp. And that was an old nickname that actually I kind of embrace now that I'm in my 50s. Um, but it, I was Pop in training camp with T.I. and those guys. And I asked Jay Kane why he called me Pop. And, and he said, he, in a meeting right after camp, he goes, you know, you made the team. And I, it looks like we're going to start you in game one. And I went, all right, I'm ready. I'll, I can't wait. And he goes, you know why I call you Pop? And I said, yeah, because I'm the, one of the youngest guys on the team. I was really young. I was turning 20 or 19, turning 20 or something. And he goes, uh, I said, it's the youngest guy on the team or, or one of them. And he goes, no, no, that had nothing to do with it. You know what happens when you bring a puppy home and you drop him in your living room? He runs, runs, around, and, runs around and piddles all over everything. <laughs> are you going to run around and piddle all over everything if I start you in game one? And I said, coach. Man, if, if that's your pep talk, <laughs> I, I don't know what to tell you. I'm excited about the game. I'll put it that way. You win a great cup with Saskatchewan in 1989. Um, I think you're actually the holder on the winning field. Oh, yeah, that's right. You are. It's on your Wikipedia page for crying out loud. All those years in the CFL amongst the league leaders and interceptions all the time, all people talk about is you holding that field goal for Ridgeway. But um, first off, just what do you remember prior to that kick? What emotions were going through your your mind? Were you thinking to yourself, don't bobble the snap suits? Or, or were you thinking to yourself, he's going to make it? Was there any doubt? I mean, what were the emotions prior to that kick? Well, it was such an exciting game. I mean, it was, a, it was, it was one of those games as a defender 
because it was a 43-40 game. 83 points combined in a championship game. It's, it's just never happens in any other league, anywhere else, that you can score that many points in a championship game. Um, so back and forth, and, you know, I had given up a touchdown. I had, I had been beaten on a touchdown earlier in the game, had an interception earlier in the game. Back and forth, back and forth, was, was semi-knocked a little bit unconscious on a reverse, on a, on a punt earlier in the game. So, you know, it was, there was so much going through our minds. But when we, when we started the playoffs that year, we played against the 16-2 and two Edmonton Eskimos again at the time. They're Elks now. But 16-2 um, and two and everyone pretty much had, had booked their ticket for the Great Cup, as you know. But the Calgary game before that even, we, we had this focus that we had come together due to some, you know, adversity that we faced together as a team. I was certainly sort of the, the point on it for a, for a lot of the wrong reasons. But we had really come together and were real focused. Like we knew that no one was given this 9-9 nine nine Saskatchewan team much of a chance. And, and we didn't care. We had Ken Austin and we had Tom Burgess, and both were top-end great people and quarterbacks and leaders. So we felt real comfortable. And we had beaten Edmonton in the preseason and one time in the regular season. One of their, when they were 16-2, and two, one of their losses was us. So we felt pretty good about both playoff games. Then we go in and, and again, underdogs against Hamilton in the, in the Cup and in the, at the time, Sky Dome in Toronto. And, uh, you know, we knew it would be full of our fans, so that was exciting. But there was a great sort of singular focus from that entire team. There was one goal in mind, so it wasn't this play. The moment it was over, we were all thinking about the next play. So to, to get to the field goal part, that's really what I was thinking. I was thinking, okay, there's time on the clock. After Champion caught that, that amazing catch in the end zone to tie the game, I thought, there's time on the clock. We can still do this. Kent's talking already. I could see his focus. He was ready to go. He hits Elgard on a deep road. And I turned to Ridgeway right away. I said, we're going we're gonna to line up here. We're gonna, we, we've got time to line up. Mark Guy makes two great catches, one over the middle where he gets whacked and hangs on, and, and then a sideline catch. And, and now we're in field goal range. And I'm trying to manage the huddle because you know old linemen, man. Like, <laughs> I used to mess with the old line, but all the time. But these guys all of a sudden became kicker coaches because we had a timeout, and then Hamilton called a timeout to try and ice Ridgeway. And in their timeout, now all the old linemen, including Bob Poley, he comes back and he's like, keep your head down. And I'm like, get up. he knows what he's doing. Like I'm trying to keep the offensive line away from the from Ridgeway, the kicker, and kind of manage that. And then Gregory wants me, our head coach. So I run to Gregory to the sideline, and he says, why don't we snap down? Now, snap, snap down was I'd bark out a, single, a signal, and the O-line would kind of lift up and then put their hands down on the ground in a three-point. And it was the reason to do it was sort of to draw the defense offside so that if we miss the field goal, we get another chance because they were offside. I said to him, Coach, what if we're offside? Now we put more pressure on our guy to make it from th from five yards back. So I said, let's kick it. We're going to win it. Forget it. Let's not do any of this. Actually talked Gregory out of it. He said, okay, go. Went back in, lined up. And Bob Poley, just before we went to kick, he said, hey, and I won't I won't use the exact language he used, but he looked at me at Ridgeway and he, and he, with his crooked, fat sausage finger, said, hey, once it leaves my hands, it's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> so Poli, uh, Poli was our, our, our center and snapper on, on field goals. We spent thousands of hours, the three of us, practicing. And, and man, when that thing went through, I still, honestly, Moj, I, I still can't describe it and give it, um, give it justice because, as you know, in this game, when you – go through all the adversity and, and all the self-doubt and all the wondering if you're good enough and those practices when you're down, the practices in the rain, all the stuff that you and your family do to get to that one chance for to be the champions of, of your country in pro sports. 
you look at that and you say, that ball goes through and you think, okay, uh, it just happened. It just, it just happened. And I, I just can't, I can't put words that, that, that do it justice yet. I still have it all these years later. More with Glenn Suter after these messages. Suits, we've seen some planning throughout your life in the sense that, you know, you, when you're a Carson, you thought to yourself, hey, I want to play college football. You wind up going to SFU or at SFU, you start realizing there's that pro potential. As your career winds down in the CFL, um, in 1994, you worked the Grey Cup for TSN as a guest analyst. You're still playing in the league. Then you decide to retire after the 94 season and you wind up working for TSN in 95, was that kind of an accident or was that something that you had been planning for? Because I know you've done some radio as well, right? So was that just another part of your plan? Yeah, it, it, sort of, but but not in the same way as the actual playing football plan kind of rolled out for me. It was more um, to keep your eyes open for other opportunities always. You know, and I, I had learned that sort of, again, in that theory of, you know, why, why not me looking at beyond my football days? So that, that year when I was in BC, I was a guest with TSM, but we were doing radio. CBC was covering the game uh, for television. Uh, we were doing the radio coverage, and I was a guest. But that year I had come back because I had worked in radio for two or three years, that was a bit of an accident. That was a, a friend of mine was a morning man there. We, we used to hang out together in, in off days a little bit. And he was the morning guy. And he said, why don't you come on as a guest? And that sort of evolved to me being uh, the sports director for the radio station over three years. But it was a tough grind because I was up for the morning show at around 3.30 in the morning, 4 o'clock. Go and prepare for the morning show, 6 to 9 on the morning. Then go straight to the stadium do all my treatments, workouts, things like that, get a bite to eat, go to, lunch, uh, go to the meetings for practice and then practice. And then afterwards you're lifting and your extra work and your extra treatment. So by the time you got home, it was eight or nine o'clock at night and it was another four o'clock wake up in the morning. So it was a, it was a grind. And in that final 94 season, I came back to do the TSN gig as a guest in the booth at Grey Cup here in BC, or yeah, in BC. And I had trained back in Vancouver. I'd taken a leave of absence of two months with my radio station because I said, you know what, I've got to go back and get my body right. Because I this, this schedule, this grind is not allowing me to get the work in I need to continue to play pro ball. Because I wanted to keep playing for another three or four years if I was healthy enough to do so. That was my plan. And so I came back to Vancouver, trained hard, then I got the call from TSN to say, why don't you come and audition in Toronto off a monitor and we'll have that on, you know, on file so that when you do retire, maybe you, you know, you, you can look at it as a, as a second career down the road. And I was like, all for that. Absolutely. You know, again, eyes wide open, keep an open mind. This isn't going to last forever that kind of mentality. So I went and did the audition, didn't think much of it. We're about a month before camp. My car is packed to drive back to Saskatchewan from North Vancouver. And I get a call from TSN saying, we want to give you the job this year. We want to offer you 20 games. You'd have to retire, obviously. This was a Friday, Moj, and they needed to know by Monday. So I called Alan Ford, who was our general manager with the Riders, and I, I basically laid it out and I said I don't know what to do I want to keep playing it was a very difficult weekend I mean it was 48 hours of zero sleep staring at the ceiling what are you going to do here this is an opportunity to do something beyond football but I didn't know if I could <laughs> I really I you know I believed that I would work to learn the new business but I I didn't know if I was going to be good enough to do to be a color analyst in sports in, in football. So it would have been a leap of faith if I do this. And I still want to play three, four years. I feel like I'm in great shape. You know, where the body and the mind are kind of right in sync. You're not too young mentally, but really strong. And you're not, you know, the, the whole balance felt like it was there. 
I asked my wife for her opinion. She said, not a chance. I, I'll support you either way you go. Smart on her part, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and you know what, Moj? You know what made the difference was that we had won in 89. And I just kept looking at my ring. And I kept thinking, that's why you play, to be part of a championship team. And I've been able to live that and experience that. So maybe this opportunity, it's, it's time to take that leap and, and take the step into a new business and a new world and retire from football. And that's kind of how that went down. And it was a tough, tough weekend. But in retrospect, it has worked out. Well, you think? <laughs> First off, you're, you're almost pushing 30 years as a TSN analyst. What, yeah. what are we talking, like 29, 28? 20, 27. This is your 27 on the so 27th. You're, <laughs> you're like Leonard Uzi, Bobby Leonard Uzi. I don't know what it is. Both of you guys don't age. Like you're sleeping from aldehyde or something. I don't know. It's like you still look good. You still sound good. I mean, you could do this for another 20, 30 years. Well, I, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that that, that would be my plan, but I, I do want to continue for, you know, at least four five, maybe seven, uh, you know, see how it goes. I, I, I really feel um, the need more and more to try and do more for football in our country, just growing the game at all levels. Um, you know, I've, I've thought for a few years now about maybe a transition into you know, an organization, and I don't mind paying my dues. I'm, I'm not. I'm not talking about, you know, jumping in as a GM or a president or anything like that. I'm not suggesting any of that. But to get in at the ground level again, start over, even at this this later point in my life, and and maybe there's a way that I can be more beneficial to growing the game than than an analyst in the booth. Although that is important, you know, a, a positive positive messaging when calling football games is so important to how people perceive our game. But, you know, I've, I've thought about that. So I, I don't know if it's going to be 10 or 20. I'll take it sort of year to year, man. I still love being up there in the booth and watching world-class athletes put on a great show in a game that has the most exciting final three minutes in the world in any sport. And I'll take that and challenge anybody if they don't believe that. Our last three minutes of our sport are the best in the world. And I'll, I'll totally agree with you on that point in the sense that, you know, and we were talking about this prior to this interview. I remember being at a Seahawks game one time. Seahawks got the ball with eight minutes left. They're playing the Patriots. They were up by a score, and they basically grinded out the clock to the point where it was, I don't know, like a 60-yard drive in eight minutes. They didn't even kick a field goal at the end. They just, you know took a knee and for the last eight minutes of the game, they just basically wiped it all out. And, you know, we see in south of the border, you get the ball back with two and a half minutes left and no timeouts with the opposition. The game's basically over. Whereas in the Canadian game, those final three minutes, hell, you could see three or four changes of possession. It's, it's absolutely amazing. You know, it, it's interesting though, hearing you talk about your love of the game. Um, it, it's something that obviously is woven throughout your entire life, but do you see yourself being an important figure in Canadian football, whether down the road, I'm not talking within two or three years, but say 10 or 15, 20 years, do you see yourself, you know, perhaps being a key figure with an organization or even with the league? Because your name has been linked to the commissioner's post on several occasions. Well, it would be a, a tremendous honor. I understand and, and have a, I feel like a, um, just in, in all the years of experience talking to GMs, talking to presidents and owners in our league and commissioners, and there's been quite a few in those 27 years. Um, and, you know, looking at the different approaches, I understand, I believe, the messaging that's necessary, that we are sort of the leaders, not only for our business in Canadian football, but also for the game itself, all the way to the six-year-old kid playing touch or flag ball anywhere across this country, this is this is a responsibility that I I I see I understand. You know, I I it's funny to me that sometimes commissioners will get hired in any sport. Really, they'll get hired and say, "Well, this is a a job I've been looking for and excited about for a long, long time, and I'm I'm honored to have it, and it's great." And and I always think, you know, I think the right response there is. I understand the responsibility of this job 
and and the responsibility is to grow this game from from the ground right up and you hear that all the time grassroots right but you actually have to implement it you have to step in and implement it because if if we start talking to six to ten year old kids about coming in and watching a bc lions game or watching a pro football game but help them too. help them with jerseys help them with rules help them with coaches help coaches and officials all of it those kids become fans you know sometimes i think we're constantly chasing 27 year old people with money and because of different circumstances throughout the past 10 to 15 years we sort of lost some of those guys and and girls we've lost some of those sports fans to the national football league and so rather than continue to beat our head against the wall we could tell that 27 year old we're always here if you want to in your backyard take your girlfriend to affordable night and see uh, tremendous athletes put on a show in a game that you obviously love anyway. Uh, you know, rather than do that, say, you're welcome to come back. Doors always open, but let's put all of our energy in six to eight to 10 year old kids. So when I think about all of that and, and a plan, believe me, I, I've written up, you know, 35 page proposals to where I would, attack the growing of the game of football in our country so yeah i consider it all the time i think about it all the time uh again i would be willing in, in at to start or, or or step in at any level and pay my dues and understand the business from all angles before you know actually getting into that influential spot like you mentioned i would i would just understand the responsibility and be honored to be part of it and then, man, roll up my sleeves. I would wrap this game in this country in a Canadian flag. I'd make sure kids loved it. You know, it would be our names on this. The six-year-old touch football kid would be a BC lion, or a lion. He'd be a lion or a tie cat or, a, you know, an elk. Or And then we'd go through the university. He'd be a Thunderbird. You know, the, those would be the team names on every touch football kid in our in our country so because you know what they do as soon as they get their jerseys they google their name they google their team name and right now they're googling 49ers and giants and teams like that yeah. so there you know there's those are that's again that's that's one you know rabbit hole of of discussion on on what we'd like to do i know our game is 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 in our country and i'll never figure it out is just how many Canadians want to pull it down and want to, you know, want to just find the holes and say that it needs fixing. Our game does not need fixing. It is fantastic. Can we always improve it? Yes. Can we always look at different ways? Absolutely. It's insulting to even say we wouldn't be trying to find ways to improve it every single turn, but it's not broken. And as we just talked about, the most exciting final three minutes of any sport in the world is Canadian football. So yeah, I'm I'm passionate about it. I could get on rants, as you know. We've you, <laughs> you and I, you and I have sat on many a different occasion, and I've got on my soapbox and talked about all the different things that uh, we'd love to see. But I know you're passionate about this game too, Mo. Yeah, totally. Um, Suits, this has been a real treat. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to uh, to stop by and give us a little background on the Glenn Suter story. And it's amazing hearing some of the, the things that you've gone through and how it's all wound up. And who knows, maybe we'll be interviewing Commissioner Suter down the road. Suits, thanks for doing this. Thanks, Mo. Jeanette, I am so honored to be on show number 27. 27. Real there. Cool. <laughs> there you go. Wrap it up nice with the, the 27 reference. Thanks, Suits. Thanks, Mo. Rewind.